here today in the bush with Ernie DeMuth of DeMuth Forestry Services. And Ernie's also the chair of BAFIA, which is the Bancroft Area Forest Industry Association. And Ernie's going to tell us today about tree marking. So Ernie, tell us what goes on um, in the process of tree marking. Where do you start? Well, we start, we start off with a prescription written by a uh, registered professional forester. That's basically our guide. Um, we, uh, we, use, we use that and we mark according to that, to that prescription. What do you need to be qualified to do when you come in to mark this bush? I mean, you've got to be able to tell trees apart. Tell us what is well, required. To be, the best uh, tra uh, form of education is a, a forestry technician diploma. You uh, then move on to uh, getting a tree marking course, which is put on by the uh, Ontario Ministry of Natural Resources. It's a one-week course, extremely thorough course on how to mark trees uh, for harvest, um, taking into account uh, uh, the silvex forest ecology and wildlife values. From there, you get audited. Uh, it takes some time. You need to get some on-the-ground uh, experience on, on marking uh, trees. And then you get audited by the Ministry of Natural Resources by marking a piece of land, and they, they assess that. And, uh, and then from there, you become certified to mark on Crown lands. And, and there's a number of issues with marking trees. What are the issues that you deal with? Well, the, the main issue is, uh, the first question you would have to ask yourself uh, when you're looking at a forest is, are you dealing with an even-aged forest or an uneven-aged forest? Um, an even-aged forest would be typically uh, species of trees that are um, intolerant to shade. Uh, these would be the pines, uh, white pine, red pine. Um, red oak is a mid-tolerant species. Um, poplar, birch, these types of trees will grow up all together at once. Um, so, so a marking uh, regime for this would be different than say a, a, a forest which is uneven aged and where it's growing up at all different levels. Uh, these are species like maple and beech which are tolerant to, to shade. So what kind of forest are we looking at today? Today is going to be a, uh, a uneven aged forest where you're dealing with mainly maple and beech. The, the trees are typically tolerant to shade. So um, you will have different, all different sizes. So you have to balance how, how, this, how this can be cut. So Ernie, uh, you know, where do you start and how do you decide what tree is going to come out of this area? Uh, well, typically when I walk into this, uh, this uneven age forest, I know I'm working in a, in a selection uh, tree marking method. Uh, with that, uh, we use uh, what's called uh, basal area. And uh, for basal area, we, we use uh, a prism to, to assess basal area. Well, for, first off, what, what I would do uh, is I, I, would, I would take my prism. I would uh, use this as a tool to tell me how much wood I have in this area. How many stems do I have that I can, I can assess? Then try and figure out what trees I can take. Um, I've already done that for this area. I, I did what's called a prism sweep with my, with my two, two by prism. We can pretty much bring this down. We can take two trees out of, out of, out of our, our area right here. So at this point, after, after I've assessed how, how much can we take, how, how much uh, we'll still maintain a good balance of, of, of trees in this area so things can regenerate properly, um, I now have to assess what trees will I take. And the requirement typically, generally, is you want to take trees that are not going to last over the next 20 years. They're going to decline over the next 20 years or very rapidly, but they still have typically some product in them that we can use. So um, first off, what I do is I got two trees to take here. Okay, first thing that I would notice right away is that we have a beautiful beach here. We'll go and take a look at this. This right here is uh, American beach. It, uh, it looks very good. I don't notice any diseases on it. I'm going to take a quick look around the other side here. I don't see any, any diseases on this that, that are apparent to me. I look up at the top of the tree. The crown looks very full. Um, uh, it looks like a very healthy tree to me. Uh, this is a type of tree that, that is going to last 20 years and well beyond. Um, I can see right away that we have uh, claw marks. They're, they're very old, but this is from, from a bear, a black bear. Uh, and what he's doing is he's going up there to grab beech nuts. Um, on, on the crown lands, we're required to leave eight 
where, where we can, we, we're required to leave eight mass trees. Uh, mass trees are typically uh, nut-producing trees. Uh, this can be American beech, um, uh, which produces the beech nuts. We've got uh, red oak, which produces acorns. Uh, we have black cherry, which produces, uh, obviously, cherries. So typically, I would just take uh, blue paint. We need a nib here. And, uh, and identify this tree as being a mass tree. Um, that, that tree's going to be saved. So right away, my eye's drawn to this tree right here, uh, this maple that's right beside it. And if you see this, you can see sugar maple borer damage right on the side of it. Um, typically, the, this type of, uh, it's an insect, the sugar maple borer. Um, damage like this to a tree, the tree can actually overcome that damage. It's actually not a significant amount of uh, uh, damage that, that this tree may make it for the next 20 years. But if you look up again, you'll see another uh, incidence of sugar maple borer damage. And then as you keep going up, you can see the tree starts curling away, trying to, trying to get light and trying to get away from this beach. With snow load, um, th th that tree is not going to last. It's either going to break where the damage has been done by the sugar maple borer, or it's just it's going to topple over because the lean is too much. So I would mark this tree to go. That's going to be one of my trees that I'm going to take out of this area. I have another tree that I can take out of this, this immediate area that, I, that I've assessed. Um, my eyes draw next to, to this maple here. Uh, obviously it's been... Um, uh, looks like it's either wind damage or a certain type of rot that's, that's affected the upper crown of it. Uh, it's broken off a good so chunk of the crown. Uh, up there you can see some black uh, bark um, and, and just internal, serious internal rot. Below that uh, internal rot you have um, a very good uh, saw log in there, so some good wa wood products. So this tree will not last for the next 20 years. So we're going to mark this tree and it's going, it's going to, we're going to utilize it. Another uh, disease that um, uh, is very common in the hardwood forest in Ontario is uh, what's called Udipella canker. Um, it's also called cobra canker because of its distinct uh, similarity to a cobra's head, the back of a cobra's head. Oh, well, yeah, there it is there. That's actually the spore fungus right in here. And that's what makes it spread from tree to tree. Um, with this one, you can see uh, we've got it here, and it looks like it's spread over to that tree there. And you'll see that both trees are marked. We're, so not only can we utilize this, this wood product from above here, because this will, this will split, this will crack at where the, 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 the canker is, but above it, you usually have great wood that, that can be used. Um, so we're not only getting this out of here and utilizing the wood, we're also getting rid of a disease and possibly making the forest uh, healthier for the future. Being a tree marker, you're um, typically one of the first people on the scene. Uh, you're, you're the one who's going to find the wildlife values, and uh, nests are, are a very important thing. Uh, typically, when we're walking through the forest, we are always looking up. We're looking at the crowns, so we notice the nests, and uh, you get an eye for actually picking them out over time. Uh, this one here, uh, just marking along, and, and you stumble into a nest like this. Um, uh, first thing we do is uh, uh, we stop our marking. We don't, we don't mark anything near the tree. Anything that we marked on our way there will have to blue out. Um, uh, depending on the species will, will depend on the protection that the, the, the nest is going to need. In the case of this one, it, it was an un unoccupied nest. Uh, it hasn't been occupied for a period of time. So what we need to do here is just, just protect the nest tree. Don't mark any trees that, that could affect it or fall into the nest and in, in, in any way damage it. So, so pretty much in this area we don't really have anything marked. And, uh, and we just leave that and we mark it on the map so it's, it's known for the next time we come back in, uh, in say 20 years or 30 years from now to do the, to another cut, we'll know that the nest is here and, and, uh, and check in on it. Another, another thing is a tree marker, uh, part of our wildlife values that we're keeping uh, our eye open for is cavity nests. Um, we're, we're required to, to identify six cavity nests per hectare um, with, with blue paint uh, so that, that they're, they're not damaged and, and to, to put aside that, that important habitat. 
The example we have here, as you're marking along, uh, I stumble onto something like this. This is an amazing uh, uh, cavity nest. This is probably the most important cavity nest that we can protect in the forest. Uh, this is a pileated uh, woodpecker nest. Uh, it's very distinctive because you can tell it's a very large hole um, where the woodpecker uh, excavated the nest. And then there's also a smaller hole, and this is the exit hole in case that he's predated and he's got an escape route. Um, these are very important uh, cavities because they're very large and they can house a wide variety of, of wildlife, uh, being uh, raccoons, flying squirrels, owls. Um, uh, and the woodpeckers, and, and uh, this is a great, wo uh, great habitat. So this is our first priority to protect these, these types of uh, cavities. So this is an example of a red oak, which is a mid-tolerant tree species. It's also a mass producer. Um, so it, it needs quite a bit li more light than, say, a maple or a beech. Um, and, and it produces nuts, which is, is an amazing uh, wildlife value to it. So we really like to try and promote species like red oak. Um, with the lack of fires, uh, red oak is also uh, known as a fire-generated species. So anything that we can do, because, because we've, we've become very good at uh, preventing forest fires, we need to maintain a balance where we can promote these type of species in another way. And uh, one way to do that is to, to give more light to oak. In this case, we have a red oak and we have a, a maple. And if you look up at the tree, you can see the tree is starting to curl away, trying to get light. And this maple is actually inhibiting this, this red oak from, uh, from, from growing properly and for the crown to spread out. So what we would do here is the tree markers, I would mark this, this maple to go, uh, to, to give this, this uh, red oak more, uh, more light. And it's, it's also called, we would be releasing the, uh, the oak. Uh, this, this here is another uh, example of an uh, of, uh, intolerant species, yellow birch. Um, it's, it's, uh, it's valuable for, for the veneer uh, in this. Um, in, the, in the past, this, uh, this, this uh, species was logged heavily. So whenever we um, run into yellow birch, especially young yellow birch, we try and take as many trees as we can around the top of it to release it so it can get the light so it can grow properly. Um, so any, any opportunities we have to promote this species, we try and do that. Uh, this here is the uh, forest operations prescription. Um, this was written by a registered professional forester uh, at the Bancroft Minden Forest Sustainable Forestry License. Uh, you can tell by the stamp on it that this has been approved by a, a registered professional forester. Um, this, is, this is the uh, guide that, that I go by uh, using my own experience and, and my qualifications. Uh, and education, I then use this as, as a guide for this specific piece of land on how I'm going to, how I'm going to mark it. Um, this here is, is the map um, identifying the, uh, this is identifying the selection area uh, where we've done most of our examples through the film have been in this area right here. This is the nest that we saw, the stick nest. Uh, it's already been identified on the map. Um, so this is all our selection area that's going to be uh, managed. Uh, this here is the uh, Ontario Tree Marking Guide. Um, it's uh, typically our, our most important manual when it comes to uh, tree marking. Uh, this is produced by the Ontario Ministry of Natural Resources. Um, in it, uh, it, it talks uh, a lot about the, the diseases. So this is a very important book for tree markers to be using. It's been stated that, that tree marking is both a, a, an art and a science. Um, it's typically not a... Uh, uh, as measurable as, as people might think think it is. The more knowledge you can acquire about the silvics of trees, about forest ecology, about wildlife values, uh, you can then take that as a technician and apply that in how you're going to, to mark a forest.